Welcome back to the Chatolic Show. It's been a while. Today I have with me Father Gavin Lopez, who is Professor of Systematic Theology in St. Pius College. Father, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me on your Chataholic show, Rolvin. The, may I also introduce him? You know him well, but uh, he's one of those seminarians who runs these very particular shows and indeed does a good job at them. So I welcome myself as well as you. Thank you, Father. That's really kind of you. Uh, today, since we are uh, discussing the idea of Lent, as tomorrow we'll be moving uh, or we are beginning the season of Lent with Ash Wednesday. Uh, what's Lent generally meant to be? Because uh, the idea of Lent is uh, very sad or things, the other 40 days that we must not do certain things. People will say we should not drink alcohol or we will not eat meat or we will not have fun for these 40 days. We'll repent for these 40 days. And very often it becomes a season of being very sad about uh, certain things, not having fun. But what is the season of Lent actually and how did it begin? Well, Dolvin, uh, the season of Lent, if you look at uh, the Missal, you find in the very first preface of Lent, it tells us that Lent is this beautiful and joyous time that God gifts to us so that we would find or try to find our way back to Him. The real meaning of Lent has to be understood in a little bit of a historical context. Forget this context usually. And that's why it becomes a period of kind of, you know, a morose, sad, a uh, very colorless period of time in our lives and we've got to give up things and we've got to kind of, you know, suppress our activities for a short while for these 40 days. And then we happily go back to them once these 40 days are over. And so, you know, that forms a very, uh, a very negative and a very uh, warped idea of what Lent really means. To understand the idea of Lent, we've got to go back into the time of the Jews moving to the temple every year for the feasts of the Passover. And this happened because you, you know that, you know, the the culture of the Jews had this important festival as it's as a beginning of the year. In the month of Nisan, people would celebrate the Passover to remind themselves of the most important event in their lives. And that is God saving them. The Passover when the angel of death moved over Egypt and all the firstborn were were eliminated except for those who had their house smeared with the blood of the lamb that they had sacrificed the previous evening. And we see that this celebration of the Passover became very centralized to Jerusalem. And so everybody, those who could afford it, had to move down to Jerusalem to go to the temple to offer sacrifice and to be able to to pray, to, to reconnect basically with that community of believers who had left Egypt and were brought into the promised land. So it was a great joy to be there at the festival, but it meant a big sacrifice. Why did it mean a big sacrifice? You have to understand that journeys in this time are very difficult and arduous. We don't have transport except for donkeys or horses for those who are rich. For those who are poorer, they would go on foot and they would make this long journey. So this long journey basically would take approximately a month or so, depending on where in uh, Israel you came from, whether you came from the north or you moved down from closer south, but it was usually a journey that was arduous. And because of this, they traveled in caravans, also because they were afraid of being waylaid or robbed like the Good Samaritan. So they moved always with company. And these caravans as they moved through these mountainous areas and through the dangerous areas, they suffered a lot of, uh, I mean, you know, a lot of hardships. They wouldn't have their normal meals because, you know, if you're moving through so many days of a journey on foot or with these animals and together with people, you're not going to have enough of food for everyone. So what did they do? They carry little scraps of food, uh, bread that would remain over a long period of time. And so it was a period of difficulty, eating less but kind of, you know, sharing stories, going over the past and remembering their families. And even we're told when Jesus went up to the temple, he had a lot of relatives. And therefore, these relatives, they told the family of the beautiful times in the past or of their family history and of probably the stories of their ancestors and things like this. And therefore, this journey was a beautiful journey, but a journey filled with hardships. People ate less, people drank less, people automatically didn't have luxuries, people slept in the open and they were kind of, you know, at the mercy of the elements. They were also at the mercy of, 
of various kinds of geographical things. For example, in some places you have uh, you have desert animals that would come and attack them and things like this. But it was a beautiful journey also because they came back to discovering that moving together towards Jerusalem. And there was great joy. So there were hardships, but there was also great joy. And this brought them back to the time when they were in the desert. The, the joy was mostly because of the... Communitarian, communitarian aspect moving, where yes. everybody moves together <laughs> to for you. a particular goal. Also, the goal was to reconnect with God. So this reconnecting happened at two levels. The first level was at the personal family level. The families with the relatives and the big khandans. You know, we've lost that. We are uh, not, you know, we don't do Lent together as an entire family with kind of, you know, long lost cousins and relatives and the older ancestors who are still alive, we don't connect with them. And therefore, you know, there's this one little aspect of not being able to establish that connection with the story of my family. Actually, our idea of the families coming together is only for a celebration. Exactly. We come together only to celebrate. <laughs> we don't come together to journey towards the Lord. That is left to more individual, yes, yes. individual It happens at funerals, actually. It happens at times like, you know, funerals or somebody's wedding. You know, there's this great joy of being together with the rest of the family. And some of us go only because we will meet people we have not met for an entire lifetime, perhaps. You, you know, it's like... Uh, the last time we saw them was at a brother or sister's wedding. And now we're going to see them at our grandchild's wedding or at a son's wedding or a daughter's wedding. So it's an entire generation later. We meet those who have remained. But we see that Lent is this time of kind of, you know, recalibrating where we came from. So reconnecting with our sources and things. Like this. But that's not the end of it. Now what happens is that this movement towards Jerusalem ends with the people going crazy when they reach Jerusalem. They entered the gates of Jerusalem with these songs. So you have so many uh, psalms, which are called the Psalms of Ascent. People going up to the temple. And why is it such a great moment? It's such a great moment, moment because they've reached their goal and they've reached their the joy of being there in the in the in the holy land, the land of can we know of, of flowing milk and honey. And they have the Lord with them, and therefore they are they shout and scream. So isn't it? How I rejoiced when I heard them say, let's go up to the house of the Lord. And now my feet are standing within your gates of Jerusalem. So the throng wild with joy and I would move up to the temple. Each of these Psalms kind of, you know, capturing the joy that is there at the end of this journey. So if we can retrace the origins of Lent, it would be to this movement towards Jerusalem. A happier understanding. So that Lent becomes this period wherein the journeying becomes a shared experience and it becomes a tremendously moving experience. Now, history takes a bad turn. Around 70 AD, the temple is destroyed. So along with the Jews, even the Christians cannot do this anymore. They can't go up to the temple. And now holiness becomes more of an individualistic uh, kind of, you know, private celebration. But the Christians uh, somehow found it necessary to maintain this period of intense, you know, coming together to celebrate the feast, the Paschal feast. Because now, the feast of, kind of, you know, the feast of the Passover, the Mosaic Passover had been, had been kind of, you know, um, superseded and now brought to its completion in the Passover of the Lamb. That is, Jesus himself was sacrificed. And so the Christians sought to keep this alive. How did they keep it alive? They chose this period of time, 40 days, to be uh, walking along with the Lord as a community in various in various ways. So the first way they did this was to imitate the temptations that Jesus had gone through in the desert for 40 days, right? So now, so for, this number 40 is pretty significant. We see yes, it come over yes, and over yes. in the... So you'll see that this uh, <laughs> is very biblical. You know, you know the... The 40 days that the people of Israel spend in the desert, it is the 40 days of courtship. They fall in love with God. They fall in love with Yahweh. And then the prophets tell us, no, the, the desert is a time when God fell in love. He found Israel, held him close to his breast and then clothed him with the finest and gave him everything. So these 40 days are very important. Then you see in the life of Jesus also these 40 days. Because of the temptations, we think that they are negative. They are not actually negative. What do you find? And Jesus tells him, you know, it's not by these, these loaves of bread alone that man lives, but by every word that comes from God. Pointing to 
this very positive aspect that you know look you may have less to eat but you don't live by this you live by the will of god by the plan of god for you so why don't you in these 40 days discover something more beautiful than just bread the absence of bread is not going to kill you so it's this beautiful re calibration of 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 the feasts that jesus gives us to overcome the basic temptations of our lives so for the first one is to to be self preserving to to try and kind of you know individualistically uh, corner resources so that we are well off he says no because that's not the that's not the goal of our life so as the christians try to keep this they also discovered that keeping these 40 days also meant bringing the community together in an intense practice of holiness on through these 40 days the community came together on these 40 days for what reason you will find that their practice during lent was not an individual practice so they fasted together they prayed together they committed themselves to acts of service which which was always done together so that the community met in households you know they didn't have these big churches that we go to now so that the entire church is sitting down and and doing an act of charity but it was like this in small groups of people they found it they found it tremendously important to reconnect remember i told you the khandan to reconnect with the khandan so it was the head of the family that conducted these services along with those who were perhaps connected through blood or through being neighbors or through being to people who were close, close to close, the community close to the in close with lived in close <laughs> vicinity so that they would they would rediscover in a certain sense why they were christian in the first in the first place in the second place the presence of the lord with them so they fasted and prayed together now this fasting and praying together meant that they put aside food for maybe that evening or that afternoon remember they are, they are working people none of them because most of them were slaves or they were people who were uh, kind of you know engaged in in um, manual labor like, you know, not only manual labor some of them were traders okay. so traders worked during the day when you know at the ports and all of these things we're talking about cities like corinth or we're talking about syria we're talking about um antioch and things like this where there was a lot of activity and so during the day they are not going to be fasting or they would fast at a time that they were they would put away their lunch but in the evening they made sure that they came together for this most important kind of the liturgy of the day was this to sit together to pray over this period of fasting so that the fasting does not happen in your room you are kind of you know cut off from the community or doing nothing and you're basically just uh, the lord uh, helps you with your self disciplining that was important for them they did discipline themselves but they also found time to go back to the tradition of making sure that the family was together or that the community was together in a celebration of lent see today this is a little thing that is missing now the the term you use is celebration of lent that's uh, yes that's the important celebration thing. it's very important because see liturgically there was a, also another practice which we call the public uh, celebration of penance today when we celebrate penance what do we do we go to a priest for confession right and we kneel down before the priest or we sit down and we we talk to the priest we have a conversation and a dialogue about what we find sinful within us the priest hears our confession gives us absolution gives us a small little penance that we are supposed to do a certain amount of prayers or a particular activity and we leave but in the times gone by especially in the early church penance was celebrated once in a lifetime so it was like this people realized that they were very sinful and that they needed the mercy of god now the community didn't allow them to make their confession alone or to feel that you know people had abandoned them they celebrated this together in a big mass that happened on ash wednesday when the bishop would actually come and impose ashes only on these people who had decided to publicly celebrate penance so they were sinners they wanted to enter into this activity intense activity of purifying themselves and so they did uh, some kind of you know activity for example the first mass the bishop would anoint them and send them away once they were sent away they would perform they would perform a lot of public service so they would welcome people into the church by laying down in front of the steps and people actually stepped on them and went into the church or they would uh, perform acts of of uh, penance where they would come into the church kneeling down from a very long distance 
making sacrifices so that they would overcome their sinful past, things like this. But at no point in time were they allowed to do this on their own. They came for the Eucharist. And the Eucharist was celebrated right up till the liturgy of the word. And once the prayer of the faithful came in, they were asked to leave. So why would they leave? Because they were not allowed to celebrate or receive communion right up till Easter. But somehow this had a communitarian dimension. The people were praying for them. In the prayers of the faithful, they were constantly praying for them. They were constantly praying for the uh, for the catechumenates. The catechumens, sorry. Those who were to, yeah, to be accepted in the church. So it was as if they were receiving a lot of spiritual help from the community. And somehow the other, you know, this whole system of sponsors who kept in touch, who knew the difficulties that they were going through. And the bishop was very closely involved. And so Lent became this period of evangelization. Now, you might consider evangelization as going out door to door, telling people about Jesus. But it also means allowing Jesus to touch the various aspects of your life that you have never even considered. So the aspect of a communitarian evangelization, because you have a lot of people who come to church but don't know Jesus. I think one thing the community would have felt that we are there with each other, especially the ones who are weak would feel that, okay, I'm not alone. alone. The entire community is journeying with me towards Easter. So that Easter or that day was like, wow, you know, that day where we are all, all going together. together. Yeah. We are all moving together towards that uh, high point, towards the beautiful you day. You know, Rolvin, there was this, uh, there's a book that captures this effect in the time of Chrysostom. In the time of Chrysostom, there are these people who are considered, or rather they come to the bishop. And they want to receive the sacrament of penance. The whole community actually cries at that moment when the bishop imposes ash and tells these sinners, we ask you to leave now so that you may be one day brought back to us. It's almost as if they were excommunicated for a period of time so that they could not receive any sacraments. And the people cried because they knew them. They know that they are not kind of, you know, they're not, Anybody else, it's my uncle, oh, it's my husband, oh, oh, I feel so bad that these people were part of us, but now they're not allowed to, to kind of, you know, to, to pray with us or to be with us. And they're performing this penance. Another thing that it did was it encouraged people to be holy. Today, your holiness is your issue. So you're trying to do something for Easter or whatever. I'm keeping off meat. Okay. But it's your issue. You handle it anyhow. So if you... If you manage to keep through it, wow, I have won individually. But that was not the case in the past. In the, in the past, the penitents actually felt that the entire community was involved. So their performing of penance or their holiness was dependent on the prayers and the support of the entire community. This is something we don't have in our church right now. Even if today, you know, we come together as a family and say, okay, I need to work on this aspect of my life. I'm saying it here so that we can all work together. together. So if there are four people or five people or three members in a family, Absolutely. You know, we come together <laughs> and say, okay, as a family or as an individual, I want to work on this, but I need your, your help, help along with the grace of exactly. God to be able to do so this. So it's very important to do this, we, to, re, to rediscover certain, certain groups. For example, if you're part of a prayer group, great. Your prayer group needs to take up Lent as a celebration and we do... Or we do pass through the weeks of Lent together as a prayer group. Or to discover a family group. This is something that is a little more interesting. Now it's possible through uh, all the technology that we have, Zoom and Google Meet, to meet various members of our family and to exchange note on how, notes on how we are going through uh, the period of Lent. And a simple thing like, you know, what did you cook today? Because they are all trying to keep away from meat or they are all trying to keep away from anything. I mean, it could be sweets or whatever. And, you know, just a sharing of the struggles that we're going through and then stories of how our parents went through Lent and things like this as a support, as a kind of, you know, so that it becomes a family based, a community based celebration rather than this sad time when we're like, you know, oh, I'm not getting to do this, to, to do something for myself. And therefore I feel bad. A lot of people also keep away from the social media and a lot of people keep away from movies and kind of, you know, uh, things that occupy their time. That's a very good practice. But can we share this kind of, you know, people find it very, very difficult to share that they, that they're addicted to either social media or that they're probably addicted to 
are saying like you can't walk up to your parents and say oh i am addicted to porn so they would i mean you'd find it very difficult to say that to them but i'm sure you can say that to your friends and you could in youth groups in groups of young people who are coming together to to overcome something that they feel is robbing life from them this is a beautiful time to start forming a support group that allows you to do this sometimes we laugh at each other but you do not know the kind of help and support you get to to outdo yourself in love for one another this is the the beauty of the church is that or is supposed to be that we are not a one person journeying together we are not one pilgrim on the way but Absolutely. we are pilgrims <laughs> on the way and that aspect is so lost because you know you say save us savior of the world some people say but yeah but we are, aren't we already, already saved, saved yeah. and mm-hmm. it it's not about me it's it's about all of us so the church is not just me you know it's not my private life or not my exactly. spiritual life it's our mm-hmm. life it's mm-hmm. our spiritual life this takes us back to the start when i said that you know they, they would journey in caravans so they like groups of people so 20 or 30 people or one whole khandan going together they might have one donkey that's carrying all of their luggage or one cart on which say one 80 year old woman is sitting and the rest of them are walking and things like this the church is like that so by the time salvation is already given to you because of your baptism but at the same time you are making your way with your entire family with your entire community towards that and this joy of coming home the joy of being at home with god is altogether a different experience you're already saved there's no doubt about that but at the same time when you give of yourself when you when you take something that is deeply yours and you present it to god there's a joy that that cannot be compared and what happens is i mean you've heard this before you know when birds fly they fly in formation there's so much of energy that is to be shared among those birds because they're flying in formation fish swim together because there's so much of synergy between each of them and it produces something new this is this is natural this is how god made us and therefore let us never be an individualistic exercise this is what the church reminds us of all the time that if we celebrate this together not only keeping away from but giving to the lord something gifting him i give to myself in this way you know it it has an altogether different joy if we leave people behind and allow them to kind of you know make their own journey through lent and we allow people who are drinking all the while and then they stop during lent and then they are on easter sunday they begin again if we leave them then that's what will make this a uh, a very shallow exercise it's not this shallow exercise this moving together this coming to know one another is an exercise of great is a great support system that helps you to solidify this behavior so that this behavior becomes stronger and stronger and stronger in you it brings back memories of you know when i was doing that i was so happy and it gives you the chance to move away from these things slowly and permanently and therefore when you do it alone there's a big difference when you're doing it alone very difficult when you're doing it with a community that actually supports you that stands by you that talks to you that prays for you that helps you boy the effect is tremendously different very very different but it's something that needs to start it needs to begin this is there it's there the church knows it but we need to start doing this now we make lent a celebration that is fantastically communal communitarian sorry communitarian that is completely fantastically um non individualistic that is tremendously scriptural that goes back to the time when people really wanted to be in god's presence one so of the one of the assignments that you have given us for this year is on marriage and as we were discussing i was thinking on uh, to improve our family lives we all in our families have certain things that we would like to do my mom would always tell me you know hey, switch off the lights or clean the room and uh, these these small aspects are also part of our uh, of our family journeys you know in in lent you know doing certain things for each other so maybe one thing that we can also implement is not just a personal change but a change in the family, family maybe absolutely. especially <laughs> saying um let's coming together for a prayer or for a meal uh, once a week and uh, helping each other in certain task in duties maybe even spending time with each other that's uh that's we so don't true get to because do. you know what happens is that um alvin 
one of the things that uh, we are becoming aware of, I mean, you know, even you might know it, especially as you go into ministry, is you find that there's a certain amount of indifference that exists within families because we have our own fundas or we have our own, you know, our own way of thinking and then we disagree with what is said and what is done. But Lent brings us to a time when uh, there's this desire to retrace our steps and to discover a time when all of us were on the same page, when all of us agreed over the most basic of things. We may not want to kind of, you know, I'm not giving up what I stand for, but I come out of a sense of sensitivity, out of a sense of, you know, this woman who's working here is my mother and she's made sacrifices for me. All said and done, whatever she may say, whatever she may be, because of that, I love her. So I want to show her love, my love for her. And therefore, at length, I use these 40 days to do that. Oh, this is my father. Irrespective of what kind of, you know, his fatherhood has meant to me. I have this desire because if he weren't here, probably I wouldn't be born. Or if it weren't for his, you know, being strict with me, I wouldn't be the person that I am today. And bringing people together because of this sensitivity that we have deep inside of us, this sense of being sensitive towards the other and to overlook their sinfulness is something we need to develop. Usually we judge people, we judge our family members according to their sinfulness because you know, when you live together, it's apparent what the other is doing and probably it becomes a little bit of a soreness within us. We can't forgive them because we can see it all the time and say, you know, you're repeating this again and again, you're doing this again and again, you are like this and you are like that. At length, you know, to imagine that we want to be together again like we were before. To, to tide over the kind of, you know, the sinfulness of this person. Say, let's just leave this aside and to discover the beauty of that person. It may work, it may not work. There are no guarantees. But believe me, when the Holy Spirit begins to work is when people come together in His name. When two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. We need to claim this gospel, this piece of this piece of gospel because it is very powerful. And you see this working. When families decide to live for one another, there's nothing in the world that can take them away from that experience. And so maybe this lane we can <laughs> instead of asking us exactly. what can I get from you? I mean, we must possibly start asking, you know, what, what can, can I, I give to you? That's that's <laughs> uh um, like like the book says, uh, return back to your first love. Exactly. You know, so the <laughs> first love is when you're wanting to give and give and give and give, and then suddenly someday it changes and you begin to ask, you know, what can I uh, receive out of this? So uh, there's this phrase where God says, no, I do not, uh, I do not desire sacrifice. I want a humble contrite spirit. No. So the humble contrite spirit is this: the the humility of knowing that. I am also a sinner. And in this community, we are a community of sinners. And we are not going to be over this sin until we are six feet under the ground. And therefore, I recognize my sinfulness among the, the, the other people around me in the community who are also sinners. So we are all going through the same, the same kind of you know, difficulties. Can we put down our sinfulness for now? Forget our sinfulness. And try to communicate at a level that brings us together. Probably of prayer probably of service, probably of the liturgy, wherein even God says that to us, no? A humble, contrite heart, I will not spurn. And so, the development of this humble, contrite heart is to develop a non-judgmental attitude, especially during Lent, to bring back these persons, to give them a special portion of love, which you've not been giving right throughout the year, to rediscovering, probably just sitting down and talking about what makes us who we are what makes us different without kind of, you know, attacking, without arguing, without tearing the other person down. So many families need this. And if we could do it, how much more beautiful our end would be? No? So that's a dream. <laughs> so as we close this, um, i like to recap maybe a little bit. I think one of the sentences you said that best summarizes that Lent is like the courtship period. You know, courtship period with these exciting days as you're moving towards marriage. And instead of looking at um, Lent as 40 days after marriage, you know, we should, we should rather look at it as those days before marriage where we are 
looking to give of ourselves because something tremendously beautiful is going to happen. And so this season of Lent, as a family, as a community, as we move together, we don't look at all the things that we have to sacrifice, but rather that's that one thing, you know, that one goal that we are willing to give off even more to be able to achieve. achieve Christ or the experience the beauty of the Paschal mystery. Anything else you would like to add, Father? Yeah, that's just about it. And I think this is going to continue. So <laughs> we've got various, uh, various things that we could discuss. And probably with time, we would do that. I think for now, we just need to remember one thing. As we get into, uh, as we get into Lent, we need to plan at least one or two activities for every week of Lent before we can start with it. There's no need to take an entire calendar and mark on this day I will do this, that day I will do that because it, it becomes very heavy and tedious. But what we can do is give ourselves or commit ourselves to the, to the exercise of community building, be it in my family, be it in my prayer group, be it in my church, be it among the people that I live with. If I'm alone, probably friends, youth groups, We've got to start at least thinking and saying, okay, on this day of the week when we meet, this is what we are going to do to experience Lent. If we can commit to just that much and have just that one experience, I think Lent is not just about counting the days. It's about counting the experiences, the emotions, the feelings, the beauty of God's presence in those moments and just enjoying Him. If we can do that, I think we're set for Lent. So, Father, thank you so much for joining us. Looking forward to meeting you next week, I think next Tuesday. Um, any suggestions what we should be discussing next Tuesday? Well. Or, 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 or maybe if uh, anyone listening to this has some suggestions, you could drop it uh, to me personally or in sure. the comments or wherever you see it and we shall discuss this next Tuesday. Absolutely. Thank you, Father. Bye-bye. Thank you.